When you go from a high carbohydrate diet to fasting, at the beginning, you'll use up glucose from your glycogen stores. We can call that phase adaptation. It takes just a couple of days. And once glycogen is depleted, you can start relying almost exclusively on fat stores. Of course, there will always be some lean mass loss with fasting. But when there's a lot of fat to metabolize, several mechanisms can come into play to preserve lean mass. This fat phase can be considered a steady state in humans because even lean people have weeks worth of fat calories. So when that gets used up, then you will go into this late stage starvation where you have to start tapping into lean mass in a big way, and that very quickly leads to death. I want to focus on the steady state in the middle after adaptation and before real starvation kicks in as our best comparator for a ketogenic diet. This is a diagram from Cahill, a pioneer in the study of fasting metabolism. When he says normal here, he means high carbohydrate. And when he says starvation, he means that steady state. And it's just showing that the brain uses ketone bodies now as compared to using almost exclusively glucose in the high carbohydrate condition. The functional reason for ketone bodies is that most fat doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier. And that's thought to be because fat oxidation generates a lot of oxidative stress, oxidative products. And a lot of the brain tissue is made out of polyunsaturated fats, which would be very vulnerable, susceptible to oxidative damage. So rather than using fat directly, using ketone bodies, uh, a product that, is, that has been, that part of that oxidation has already occurred, is a much more safe way to run the brain. There's also a nice feedback loop when you're fat adapted, such that the more fat you're using for energy, the more it spares protein. Protein is needed when you're not eating carbohydrates as one of the substrates that glucose is made out of by gluconeogenesis in the liver. So in one way that this spares glucose is simply that many tissues can use either fat or glucose. And so if the glucose isn't there, they will use fat. But there are also other ways in which muscle tissue can be spared. So for example, glycerol. Glycerol is what one thing that triglycerides are made of. Triglycerides is the form of fat most that we mostly eat or get from our stored fat tissue. It's got three strands of fat tied together by a glycerol backbone. And so when you take off those fat strands to burn them, you're left with glycerol, which very conveniently can be used for gluconeogenesis. So the more fat that you're burning, the more of that you have available. Similarly, one of the ketone bodies, acetone, is actually a substrate for gluconeogenesis. So the more ketogenic you are, the more of that you have available. Ketone bodies themselves from a signaling point of view, seem to give the signal for the body not to tear down protein. So that's another anti-catabolic mechanism. And finally, I wanted to just mention the Cori cycle, which was pointed out also by Cahill, where what's happening is you've got glucose that you made in the liver and you send it out to the periphery and it gets oxidized. And one of the oxidation products is lactate. Lactate gets sent back to the liver and then can be re, it, it's a substrate for gluconeogenesis, so it can be made back into glucose. Now, of course, it's not a perpetual motion machine. You need to add something, but it turns out that what you need to add to make that happen is simply energy that can be provided in the form of fatty acid oxidation. So that's one way that you can use fat to provide glucose via recycling. All right, so here's our first study on fasting, the effect of fasting on sleep. It's a small study, but it's informative. They took 10 healthy men and they fasted them for four days. Here's what happened to slow wave sleep. You can see the effect took a couple of days to fully appear, but slow wave sleep was increased. Similarly, we see that REM sleep went down slightly over the course of a few days. Here's a second human study. It actually wasn't full fasting. There was a restriction to 10% calories. That's enough to start that fasting metabolism. The caloric restriction phase is in the black bars. If you look at panel A, you can see that they only went two days, unfortunately. So we don't expect necessarily to see the full effect that we might get if they went longer. Panel B shows that 
REM sleep went down, but it went down so by such a small amount that it's not even statistically significant. Now, non-REM did go up significantly. Panel C shows that it's all from stage four. This panel E at the bottom shows an increase in growth hormone, which you might expect because, as we've seen, growth hormone pulses are very tightly connected to slow-wave sleep. Now, growth hormone is a increases in it are a robust finding in fasting, and we do talk about that a lot in the ketogenic community, but I rarely see that explicitly connected to sleep, so it was nice to see that here. <laughs> 